I see. You found our little hiding spot in the universe. Don't get too comfortable. This is a place where you will find those with an experience that's out of this world. Or possibly deep within your life. I welcome you to the Oracles with James Tyson. Lean forward and listen. We will pull you into a supernatural journey with guests from around the world, each one experiencing some of the most extraordinary phenomena this wee planet has to offer. Now, here are the Oracles with James Tyson. Thank you, Liam, and thank you, listener, for tuning in to this episode of the Oracles with James Tyson. I am James Tyson, and today I bring you... Eugene Braxton. He's been called America's mystic. Well, what is a mystic? Can refer to those who have attained insight in ultimate or hidden truths. Okay, that's Eugene. He's certainly done that. It also means uh, someone who's gone through a transformation supported by various practices and experiences. And I'd say, yeah, that would be definitely Eugene. See, Eugene, ever since he was a young boy, had the ability and was very confident in astral travel and um, out-of-body experiences. So at night, he would rise from his body and off he'd go through the ether, arms spread out wide, and he would just travel around and, you know, pass the other people as they, they were doing their out-of-body things. And he just thought everybody could do that. This came in handy uh, at the age of 15 when he, we'll call it, he drowned. Was it a near-death experience? Well, you can call it that. I call it a death experience because his broken body was completely still, filled with water and he went up his soul left it and traveled on his energy moved from his body and went to a location and he because of his experiences for years and years of astral travel had the ability to remember every detail in his out-of-body experience as a result of his drowning and then, of course, zipping back into the body, kicking his feet up, and off he went. As a result of that, you go through a number of investigations. People thought they'd come and poke and prod at him, and it was one of these people that decided he was a mystic because uh, they were quite impressed with the types of things he did. One of them was uh, Dr. Atwater and the Dean of Near-Death Research and editor of the Journal of Near-Death Studies, Dr. Bruce Grayson. They were the world authorities in this, and I think it was Dr. Grayson who, who coined the term mystic when the talking about Eugene, and it was very interesting. He was not kind of pushed aside and said, okay, this is something you're going to end up having to do and do this report, fill this thing out, and we're going to call you a nut, and off you went. Well, no, they took it seriously, and uh, they studied him for quite a while and put out a number of academic papers in regards to Eugene. And later on, this led to Eugene uh, putting together a book, America's Mystic Solves Near-Death Riddle. It's kind of interesting if you if you take that title to heart. America's Mystic Solves Near-Death Riddle. If you read his book and you understand Eugene, you would know that there isn't anything more to the near-death riddle. Like, okay, I had a near-death experience. I traveled above. I saw myself in the hospital looking down on my body. And eventually I went back into my body or I went down this light. My grandmother came through and we went on and it was so beautiful and felt so good. And I wanted to stay, but I got told I had to go back and whack. I was back in the body. People say, oh, I don't know what happened. Uh, could it have been A? Could it have been B? Who the heck knows? Well, if you read his book, it basically says this is what happens. And uh, it was proved by, you know, whether it was Dr. Grayson or uh, Atwater, all the studies that went through. It's basically done. It's not that convoluted. Some of these world authorities on experiences uh, in these things are basically telling Eugene to keep up the good work and telling people what actually happens when you have a near-death experience. It shouldn't be anything mysterious anymore. We've had enough of these people who have it and talk about it, and you probably have somebody in your family, some old grandfather who may or may not want to talk about his time that he had a heart attack and got zipped to the hospital in the ambulance. But 
he had a near-death experience, has some memory of what happened when he was on the other side. And he can write that off to be, you know, as your brain is shutting down and everything is going on and the trauma, you're, you have all these different experiences mentally, therefore you make up all this stuff. And now that we talk about near-death experiences, are we actually expecting something like, something like that when we die temporarily? And therefore, we create it ourselves because it's like that planted information. You've got this little spark planted in there that there will be a near-death experience. Therefore, we create it. Well, it, it's been done. Like Eugene did this years ago. It's been studied um, you know, from Temple University on. These things are interesting because it's new to anyone who's experiencing it. But the research has already been done. Eugene had experienced it. He had the ability to remember every little detail in his experience on the other side and talked about it. And it was studied. And the university professors poked and prodded at him. And, of course, they said, yeah, he definitely did. And he remembered everything. And his experience followed by many, many years of, of extremely lucid dreams. Now, lucid dreams, by definition, are that, you know, can I just remember? I know that I'm dreaming when I'm dreaming. It, they don't have to be um, filled with colors and bouncing and all this stuff. But his dreams, um, his visions, and other strange encounters had led to whole his skills and to further define mystic about Eugene Braxton. Once he gets talking about this stuff and going through his memories, he almost channels. It's very interesting to listen to Eugene describe his experiences because it's a flow of consciousness. A lot of times when I've interviewed Eugene, I will uh, try to put um, the little kid's bumper lanes up in the bowling alley like to keep him on track. Today, I just thought, I'm going to let Eugene hit him flow. I'll ask a question, and Eugene is just going to go. And the different things that he speaks about and the different things that comes through Eugene, it, it's amazing. Now, Eugene, you know, he's I think he's retired now. He uh, worked a lot with police. He worked at a university. He hasn't been, quote, unquote, woo-woo his entire life. He hasn't been the hippie. He hasn't been out um, in the metaphysical la-la land. Actually, a lot of my friends are. But uh, he's the type of guy that is pretty black and white. But when he gets going on this, it's very, very interesting to listen to him. I want to keep that pure for you. You have to pay attention because he is going to explain things. When he is in his, his Eugene flow, it is amazing the information that comes through. Absolutely amazing. Particularly around the, um, the term God and where he he is going and the energies that he feels. Uh, it, it's very, very interesting. And just a little bit of the background on Eugene, too. He was dropped off at a church uh, that literally swaddled on the snowy footsteps of a Philadelphia church and given up for adoption. And like that is a movie. You open the, the priest opens the doors of the church because somebody knocked at it, and there's this little swaddled baby on the snowy front steps. Well, that's how Eugene appears into uh, into life at that point. Uh, and no, for those of you who are thinking, you know, he was planted by aliens or something like that. No, he later in life he did find out um, a little more about his family. But uh, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, who this guy is. Uh, he's uh, a father. Um, he's uh, had a, an entire life, and uh, now he kind of sits back and he wants to talk about I uh, want to introduce you to Eugene. Eugene, how are you doing? James, I've been good, my man. How, how about you? How have you been? I have been well. It's been an interesting uh, few weeks. I was down in, uh, what was it, uh, McMinnville, Oregon, at a UFO festival. I am heading down to the Preston Castle in Northern California coming up in well, about a few weeks, mid-June, and from there down to AlienCon in L.A. So bouncing around a bit yeah. and trying to get out that's, doing stuff. That's good that you're in the States. Um, do you think you'll ever come like to the Midwest or East Coast? The East Coast? Uh, I hope so. Uh, the closest I've been okay. is it was out in Harrisburg and Gettysburg. Uh, a couple oh, of years yeah, ago. that's right there. And yeah, it's like Gettysburg, like eleven miles from Philly. Really? Well, shit, yeah, the front door, because I will be, left. I will be going to Gettysburg again. Uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, we'll dance on the table. Yeah, I'll we'll have to go. Uh, I'll hit you up, and we'll go out and uh, poke at the ghosts at the battlefield. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, um, and I am going to Sturgis, South Dakota, in August, but that's 
the wow. most redneck capital of the freaking world. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I was uh, going a uh, motorcycle ride with my buddy down there and uh, see what kind of shenanigans and I got to get. I, I'm just saving up bail money right now. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it was, it's a nice country out there, though. Yeah, it is. It was really cool. I went past, past the um, the Battle Little Bighorn um, cool. Memorial and actually the location and did the tour there and uh, ate some really good food actually there and uh, up out to Devil's Tower in Wyoming and yeah, it was. I had a lot of fun. Um, so I'm gonna do that again this summer if the if the weather agrees with me but enough about me (laughs) that's it thanks everybody for tuning in and learning about my holidays this year uh eugene uh tell my listener exactly uh exactly not exactly but you know um you've got your book your book is still out america's mystic solves the near-death riddle and i love that title because um it's it's like there is no near-death riddle anymore it's just you solved it because uh, because you've always had the ability since a, a really small child, you did out of body things. Okay, let's start there. What you know as a, as a, as a little kid, tell me about um, your out of body stuff you used to do and you thought basically that was what normal people did. Yeah, <clears throat> James, yeah, the uh, out of body started early at about age six. And uh, they were intertwined with uh, lucid dreams where you realize that you're dreaming and also with regular dreams and uh, out of bodies of varying like levels of consciousness where uh, you would have an out of body experience where you were fully awake and invisible in real life. Or you could have an out of body experience where you were flying through the air in a standing position yet almost fully asleep and you or and you can look around and see other people flying through the air uh asleep too or awake it's that's uh, an interesting thing so they were interspersed with the dreams and lucid dreams so after about six years of that <laughs> by the time i was 11 or 12 i could distinguish between what was an out of body what was a dream what was a lucid dream flying dreams the sleep paralysis which is a big thing in a lot of esoteric things um, we can talk about. But uh, that's how it started with the outer bodies and then the dreams uh, and lucid dreams were interspersed completely intertwined until I could tell it exactly which one was happening and I knew what to do or what to expect. So that's how that started yeah. yeah did, did you have some, when you were doing that, did you have some control of yourself in the out of body stuff? At first, no. It was, uh, it was like forced to uh, uh, watch what was happening, forced to go along with it, and uh, forced to experience it. And I, at age nine, I did ask for it. And at age 11, it started happening like in earnest, you know, really happening. Where I was uh, 11 then, it could take more than I could psychologically than at age seven. And uh, uh at age seven, um, probably more things like dreams, running dreams, monster dreams, stuff like that. Uh, there were drowning dreams, but future dreams. But yeah, the dreams out of bodies were interspersed. And um, I got fully used to them, where I could begin to control them. Uh, after recognizing over and over and over the steps to an out of body, which are in the book, or I could go through now, I began to recognize what was happening, observe it. And uh, remember, this went on like week after week for uh, six, 10 straight years. I had about, uh, uh, altogether, about 12,000 out of bodies at different levels of consciousness. So I got really used to them. Um, and then after a while, uh, after like, say, 12, I was able to control them, the dreams, the lucid dreams, the out of bodies, and play with them. And uh, some interesting things with all of those things. And the out-of-body is actually the key, and so are dreams. Dreams are the like doorway to all these psychic experiences. Uh, it's a gateway uh, experience that will lead. It's a safe, natural way to get uh, to the other uh, abilities and the other experiences through the dreams, and uh, which is like a cousin to the out-of-bodies. When you when you were doing the out of bodies and you found you can control them um, and you kind of were having fun with them and playing with them, did you travel 
uh, any further than where you lived, or is it was it um, could you you know go up uh, upstate kind of thing and, and go visit or go look at stuff at night? Yeah, a lot of times um, it was uh, a spontaneous like during experience. It was a spontaneous thought, like a. Uh, uh, traveling, like uh, you might see something that re- might remind you of being in a grassy meadow, or might remind you about going to China. Uh, you uh, might wake up an out of body form in your room, see a book about China, and decide I want to go there. Then you're automatically there, or you can actually experience super flying there at super speed. Uh, uh, in those, in those like astral experiences, it's thought actuated so what you think about happened uh, if you say if you picture yourself or sit or want to be buried up to your neck in sand it'll happen until you unpicture yourself or picture yourself somewhere else uh, another interesting thing is you may be uh, talking to someone uh, in those dream and astral planes and they're kind of like a uh, they're all in the same uh, room. They're just different veils. And when your experience and, and, and knowledge of those things uh, develops, you'll be able to see through uh, more and more veils um, of uh, dream consciousness and out-of-body consciousness. But, um, yeah, the traveling happens naturally. Usually uh, spontaneous thought brings it on. Or you can pre-plan it uh, seconds in advance, or when you go to sleep, you can say, I want to go here in astral body form. And you'll find yourself there. And usually the signals that you're there, you'll remember this is exactly where I wanted to go, you know, in, in the dream, like to travel to. Mm-hmm. But suppose you want to uh, know the future, know the past, or, or know how to dunk a basketball. Uh, during your sleep, your astral body would come out and go to that place where you could know that thing. And while dr- while you think while dreaming about, you realize this is what I wanted to dream about. And you would literally wake up in the dream, in like a uh, and and then experience what you uh, your request. But you can train the mind to do th- work for you while you sleep, and that's worth more than any kind of uh, money, book, anything like that. Uh, because it's a constant free genie that you literally literally have, like the genie in the bottle story. People have it. Oh. They kind of don't really yeah, it, uh, realize it, it. From the books I was reading, or at least looking at when I was 13 and 14, wow, I would have really liked to go to those places. Uh, <laughs> those, mm-hmm. Those, mm-hmm. You know, the ones that are hidden under your mattress. The um, You were uh-huh. mentioned the veils in Dream State. Uh, can you kind of amplify a little bit on that? Like, it, um, I was trying to picture that. I'm, I have my eyes shut while you're talking, and I'm picturing what you're saying, and that one was really, really interesting. I'd like to spend a little more time. Can you describe what you mean by yeah. veils? Yeah, that's a good question. And um, it's always good to when you get asked questions that no one else has asked you because you get to think about it, and the questions are good uh logical one and interesting one then you get to it just pull it's good to have uh, questions pull info out mm-hmm. so yeah those veils that I was speaking about so uh, they have to do with uh, uh, there's like veils of consciousness and uh, just as everyone has like a level of, or there are levels of consciousness like a lot of times the researchers will say all right let's let's uh, do the con- we're going to figure out what consciousness is and and, and and solve it, but it's such a uh, a spiritual, invisible, and illusionary thing that, uh, just like Einstein said, the best way to do it, and the scientists know that this is true, is through uh, direct experience, which usually and mainly the experiencers have. So the scientists, researchers realizes that the regular people themselves are the best ones to get the, and they, to extract the information from. That's how they kind of see it. Uh, uh, they're the gold mine of the info. Um, uh, but what they want usually is a one who has had uh, psychic experiences at a young age and then grew into them uh, or developed them. Mm-hmm. Uh, instead of getting them at age, suddenly at age 24, 
and then kind of going through the what's happening to me years for 10 or 15 years till they finally figure out. They'd rather have someone who's did it naturally at a young age, so by the time they're in the 16 or 17, they know, you know, they're a pro at it. Yeah. But the, the, the veils change. Uh, yeah, there's with consciousness, um, just like when we go to sleep, uh, we first lay there for a few minutes, our eyes uh, are still adjusting to the darkness. Then with a few breathings, or just naturally after a full day, our body starts to loosen up. And we know the room is locked, the house is locked, everything's cool, everything's tight, the dog's out there. Everything's safe to go into a deeper, uh, more relaxed slumber where the body starts to relax. And it's more of like an inner thinking. And uh, and, and then you get into the, the stage where you're, you're not even moving at all, and then the thoughts slow down. So all those are... It, uh, subtle uh, uh, levels of consciousness and uh, lower levels and by going through those lower levels especially if we have continuity of consciousness where the consciousness extends continues on as your body goes to sleep your mind continues to be awake and aware uh, more subtly aware but still dimly aware just like you can be half asleep while drifting off and you know you're going to sleep and someone comes in the room it doesn't does it silently or they open your door or they you know and you realize that they're there so you become aware that you're aware as you're going to sleep of both the physical world and the dream or invisible world which is actually the astral world um so uh we want to be uh, aware of the things that happen to us in our dream and invisible and spiritual life because that's really half of us uh, with most people, and especially nowadays when people are, are realizing that there are other things outside of the physical world and up, outside of their, uh, in their inner self. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, the veil, so there are different levels of consciousness, different levels of sleep consciousness, and the way to uh, observe them and experience them is have continuity of consciousness, which can be easily attained for free just by doing those rhythmic breathing exercises. And those breathing exercises, so they, are, they are the bridge that will lead you to cross, into, cross over into the dream dimension, fully conscious. You'll be able to remember in sequential order exactly what happened. And there's a lot of info and adventure along the way if you're fully awake during the, uh, the dream experience as it leads into it. Artists and, and, and scientists and stuff in that mid-range between awake and sleep realize that they're in a direct conscious, they're in direct contact with their subconscious, their higher mind, and information is exchanged there. A lot of times they, they use, a lot of times they do remember and get up and write it down, whether it be a, a piece of music or a, a, a equation. A lot of times it's not remembered, but they remember it later as they're walking down the street. Something pops into their mind, the answer, how to do the dunk shot or shoot the arrow, you know, or whatever. And it's literally like whatever you're thinking about. That's why, uh, and in these things, when you can control your thoughts and emotions, that helps the best. I always say to be like a Mr. Spock type, where you're just observing and absorbing. Is the veils the sleep levels? Uh, the veils are the uh, the layers in between the different levels of consciousness. They are sleep levels in essence, yes. Okay, so, um, so what I want you to say is just say basically what you just said. And start with the word okay. so. So the veils. And okay. so, go ahead. Okay. So the veils are um, various uh, layers that divide the levels of consciousness, whether awake or asleep. And when we go to sleep, uh, we can uh, we usually notice the veils, the different veils, the different or stages. You could call them stages or levels. Um, but uh, Visually, in, in our subconscious and our awake mind goes by visual, communicates in the visual language, things that we can see. Uh, that's important, too. And so uh, you can uh, visually uh, observe these uh, levels. And uh, there's also a lot of illusions, the illusionary veils. Uh, with enough time and experience, the person can perceive the difference between the reality of the invisible uh, stages and these levels of consciousness and the uh, illusionary veils. Like here's an example, sleep paralysis. 
uh, which is uh, uh, defined by the Journal of Sleep Disorders as a state or level of consciousness, and, and it is. But when people are paralyzed, they uh, go through all kinds of horrific psychological uh, uh, trauma, where it's actually physio-spiritual, where it is literally happening, but invisibly. And when the wife or girlfriend uh, turns over and sees her boyfriend or, or husband, they're paralyzed. Uh, and he's there, if someone could just wake me up, I can't move. That's, if that's a weird thing. So um, he's going through a lot of stuff, and and uh, psychologically. But uh, see, you're caught in between a physical world and a spiritual world. His mind was awake in the spiritual side, but his body was rigidly asleep physically. And it has to happen because uh, sleep paralysis also is the... Uh, preliminary signal for an out-of-body. So at that time when paralysis occurs, if the person can just continue on without emotion, going, letting whatever events happen, because usually you're never touched or anything. It's mainly psychological. And it's a lot of times it's seen as a psychological attack. Uh, uh, they don't know a lot about sleep paralysis, and they don't like to delve into it. And uh, they also don't like to delve, because it's related to the controller, what the scientists call controller, what I call the controlling agent in charge, uh, an entity that seemingly can go through all these various paranormal rooms and fully control the situation. Scientists, uh, they talk about it in privately, but not publicly. And that, they purposely left that out because it represented, of course, a God figure or the opposite of a God figure. But uh, the levels of uh, the, love, the level of the veils, illusionary veils, and the levels of consciousness are all connected. And the higher your level of consciousness, the more awake you are as you go through the experience, the more you can see uh, between illusion and reality. And it's a full mixture of illusion and reality. So it becomes one thing where a person thinks they're seeing something and they're literally experiencing something else, just like in the UFO alien abduction thing. Wow. So, uh, but the best practice is through the dreams and you can have content. You can remember everything. There's seven, we found seven memory problems associated with all of these things, psychic experiences, uh, and, uh, the best way is to practice those breathings because they will keep you awake and you'll be straight, you'll be able to see what's really happening as you go through the any kind of dream out of body experiences, but mostly they're re not remembered. There's a lot of info that's being erased and forgotten because people won't do the breathings, they'll do everything else the postures, they'll, they'll, the right kind of spirit and attitude, but they won't do the breathing exercises. And as your body's slowly going to sleep, those breathing exercises, because it becomes a ritual, rhythmic habit and you'll continue on breathing and that will keep you awake as you begin to slowly separate from your physical body the astral comes out so you concentrate on your, your breathing is it like as you inhale it's like are you imagining it coming through your like the energy coming through your crown chakra or are you just kind of taking that deep breath and some people call it like uh stomach breathing where your stomach comes up or is it yeah is is that the kind of breathing? It's a deep breath, but it, it's almost like you're filling your 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 tummy chakra with air, so and holding it. Yeah, yes. yes, you said it exactly, James. Because it's it's actually best uh, the way you said it to actually visualize it in some kind of way, and actually physically do it, especially physically do it through the stomach first, and then the chest, because you get like what. 46% more air that way. Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of people will just do the breathings and some will just visualize. But just as you just said, the best way to do it is to visualize something positive or energizing as you're doing the literal physical breathing. This is those physical breathings that will uh, uh, keep you awake enough where you can walk from one physical world to the interdimensional world and be awake while doing it. And, and, and it's... Uh, I can easily explain what it's like. It's kind of like just um, where you just merge, you merge into the scene. And if something happens, like you have a leg jerk that suddenly jerks and then you flip awake, you'll be pulled back into the uh, dream process. You'll have to go back to, you know, do it again. 
But those breathings, most people fall asleep while they're going to sleep and doing the breathings. They get loose, the body gets loose. They're not concentrating. The breathings make them focus on one single thing. And a lot of times you'll uh, be doing the breathing. Most people can't do 18 and stay awake. Uh, so that's why uh, you, you got to do them at the right time. And the morning is really good, but the afternoon is very good. And you don't want to do them when you're too tired because you'll just knock out. You want to be tired but not dead tired, like an afternoon nap is the perfect. Or when you wake up in the morning and decide, let me go back to sleep because it's Saturday. That's the perfect time. Then you're much more likely to have an out-of-body in the afternoon or in the morning than at night. You can have them at night, but... If you do it while you're slightly charged, because the out of body means that the astral body is recharging the electromagnetic energy in the air. And then you, if you're awake while that's happening, you get to see it happening. And Sylvan Muldoon, the Scottish guy in the 1920s, he explained it perfectly in the right way, because he knew exactly how it was going. And uh, he was right. And it comes up and out, and you, you recharge your astral in the electromagnetic energy in the air, which is what the Indians call it, prana. And also the breathings, you can absorb that energy too. So when you're doing the breathing exercises, the more air you get in your body, like like a Darth Vader or any of those villains who super breathe, mm-hmm. the much more powerful you are. And it literally uh, electrocharges your body. And so uh, remembering, staying awake, and most people are shallow breathers. And you see how the athletes breathe and stuff, and we barely get anything out, maybe 15 or 20 percent. Um, and, uh, you know, you see the cross-country runners who never need to stop. So people have to breathe deeply in real life, and especially when they do the uh, the meditations and breathing exercises and dream control. If you can get into the dreams and work and, and get to experience and know what they are and develop them, all the other things will come just from the after effects of having the dream experiences. But the breathings, and they don't really stress that, or else they don't know about it. They don't talk about paralysis a lot. They don't talk about the white lights, all the effects, and what those things really are. There's a lot that they don't know that, and I'm not definitely not going to tell everything, but there's enough to show people that, look, there's a lot they don't know, and there's a little that they won't tell you, like about the controller. But uh, I'm not really concerned. I just like to do my own thing, and anyone who wants to know, that's cool. I can... But it's a lot to it. It's really fun. It's Most of it's free. And it's a solo, like, individual thing where you can do it by yourself. You know, you can go in your room and something you can practice, like, you know. And the, the side effects are, are great. And the ultimate goal, of course, and that's what the mysticism is, is to consciously unite and connect and merge in with God. And it has been done and can easily be done. A lot of times, just depending on the desire of the person. And on the way, all kinds of things that people would want, that people in this earth plane really want, like the powers and the knowledge and to see into the future and all that stuff, you automatically get that when you climb each step to get closer to God, especially if you just only want to be with God. You get those things naturally and strong because he knows that you'll use them in a good way. People who well, want to say it's someone evil, I want to rule the world, become the president, and then de- you know destroy it, and I'm going to use the powers to do it. They're already limited at the amount of abilities that they will be able to acquire. And uh, uh, they will never get, an evil person will never get super strong uh, psychic or mystic powers like that. They won't, they won't be allowed to, or they'll be destroyed after getting them. It's interesting that, that side, but... Um, if the person just seeks the high, you always want to go to the highest level, the highest authority, the, the thing behind everything, the controller. And just looking his direction and going to him, you'll get everything, all those psychic things that the people in this world really want. But by the time you get those powers and abilities and you're seeking God, you are not even interested in using those things because you see there's a lot more levels to go. With a lot more. You're not interested in like like world things. You want only like invisible higher things and, you know, being in a higher way. But the powers and stuff, that's like silly. When you see that, wow, there's a real God, there's a real afterlife, I can ask any question or do anything to my body and it'll happen. There's a, so then that other stuff like gold and stuff, that becomes like meaningless. Like it just disintegrates. It's not like nothing. And uh, you, then you don't want, it seems like you don't want anything. Like we don't watch TV, we don't, 
kind of just only want to connect with that God force. It's a really deep thing, but all those other things are given to you if you fully search God. That's really there's a real God. Yeah. It, That's crazy. Now, if somebody it, wants to uh, talk to you about this a little bit further, what? Uh, how can they get a hold of you? You're on, you're on Twitter? I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm on, I have a America's Mystic Facebook page and, uh, yeah, if they want to really talk, to message me privately, and uh, some, oh, some people do, and uh, I've never met any kind of wild people or bad or hateful people, not even once. And uh, it's been really cool. To, it's like the people who are into this stuff, uh, they really only want uh, the knowledge and some friendship, uh, but they want the info of the paranormal, and that's what I always wanted when I was young and had to super dig because we didn't, you know, in, in actual libraries for the info. And um, because no church and school was uh, about that thing, stuff, but especially back then, you know, yeah, they had yeah. other things. You'd be locked up. As you remember. <laughs> yeah. We're, you were probably within the same age group. Yeah, I think we are. And, uh, it was like back then, if you talked about, well, yeah, I just saw a flying saucer, they'd throw some net over you and call the white you know, <laughs> yeah. Cadillac afterwards. Yeah, here you go. Oh, we have a place where you can go talk to all your friends. Uh, yeah, you would not be believed at all. Mm. You'd have to produce it, then they believe it. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's the whole thing. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to go out looking for one. You have to uh, prove it to me. Well, that's not how this works. I don't have to prove it <laughs> yeah. to anybody. I know it exists, so you go find it. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, and that's a cool thing about. Oh, go ahead. That's a cool. Thing. Yeah, that's the cool thing about that, uh, everyone getting into the paranormal and the spirituality thing, because it can be an individual thing where a lot of it's just you, your own mind, your thoughts and feelings and experiences. It's kind of like a super learning thing where, and and the good thing about it, there's, there's after effects that come from just like going into a haunted house that are, can be rough at the beginning, but usually turn out very beneficial. Usually the person is glad they did it. The after effects are good. Like I used to have a thing in the late nineties where I wanted to get as many like psychic powers, psychic energies as I could. So I would look go around looking for boosters, things that would super amplify the abilities I had and would could further amplify it. So uh, I found a haunted house in Philly that was supposed to be like nationally super haunted. So we went there. I went with uh, three other people, two guys, uh, a goddaughter, and uh, not least a Spanish one. <laughs> And uh, my son, who was like seven, so Lisa, uh, Cindy and Eddie stayed by the car while me and the guys went up. And they were like 19, 16, 17, you know. So we all three went up, and we saw behind this haunted mansion, extremely haunted national preserved house and everything, uh, what looked like three beams of light. They were as tall as telephone poles, and they were literally like walking, like you'd seen some kind of Casper cartoon they were like w look like walking illuminated uh, luminous trees but of course they didn't have legs they were just these beams uh a month to the day after that happened we saw a ufo over the philly airport and then that year kicked off like the near-death research and eddie had a super year too like with football in school and uh um but the after effects from that haunted house were super extreme. We were able to make two good films there, and we caught a lot of paranormal stuff on films. Like one girl physically changed hair, eyes, and all looks uh, seven times in 11 seconds. We got that on film. And another one um, super glowed, like her beauty super expanded just from standing in front of the house. And she, she was seen running from it three minutes after we took her there. But the reverse, the... Uh, when we slowed down her footage of her going to the house and coming home from it, the nice, charming Sharon Stone type of city Philly girl turned into a, a, some kind of super witch. And even at one point had the witch hat on, Je uh, mm -hmm. James, when we slowed it down in slow motion. So we were able to make a double, one in slow motion and the other in regular speed. And uh, as we, <laughs> it was deep. She, she was a believer after that. Her mom had believed in it. So you can go to a haunted house if you want some powers fast. You've got to be able to handle them. So go, you can, there's places you can go, touch this quartz, and, and get the powers. But um, it's mainly about going to God or the highest power, because then you don't need anything in the world except, like, your family and the ones you love. Yeah. You don't need any like, material thing. 
you can, you can, if you want it, he can easily give it to you. And that's a thing too I've been working on. This thing called rapid manifestation, where you think of something, you get it quick. It started out with, you know, buses and subways. Like I can't wait for a half hour. But now uh, I can get it to where I can almost get anything I want immediately, depending the, on the importance. But uh, those are things that should literally be ignored as you want to get higher into knowing about who he is in a devotional type of way. Because when you think about it, God has made sure everything good that we've had, it, it, a lot of it hasn't been our power. It's been an outside power mm -hmm. that's happened. It's, it's, so it's something that's deep. But uh, it's a worthy thing to look into. It's the highest thing that you can do, like the search to who God is, who I am, what will happen after I die, and who are the aliens. Those are things that must be known, and people want to know, too, a lot. Yeah. There's so much out there. Like, you have so many questions, and that's why I like doing this, because it, every time I think I get an answer for something, it leads me to 300 more questions. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it is kind of fun that way. Now, this is, you know, I, I worked, I just if you're just bumping into us, actually, you, it's a podcast. You can't just tune in halfway, but I'm going to remind you, we're talking to Eugene Braxton. And if you do want to talk about these things, uh, go to his, um, if you go, if you're in, on the Facebook, you can go to uh, his Facebook per, uh, purge, America's Mystic. Um, go to Eugene's Facebook page, America's Mystic. Uh, like his page, and uh, you can send him a uh, DM or a private message through there, and uh, he usually replies within a couple hours, so if, if he gets that little notification ringing in the background, if he's not out uh, doing a supernatural tour in his <laughs> in his head, um, yeah, Eugene, this is kind of cool. Um, I, I, one of the things I need to um, really... I don't really need to, but I really want to. I want you to tell the listener about the the experience you had when you were 17 and what developed from there. Now, and just to recap, Eugene has been doing out-of-body stuff ever since he was a, a kid, like uh, five or six years old, and he has, he has the ability to actually remember what he's doing when he's in this, um, in that, that, oh level that that what's the term oh you're in that vibration Dimension. yeah when you're uh -huh. when you're out there floating around you actually have memory of everything you're doing now jump ahead to the age of 17 what happened then you're talking about the near death oh yeah or i i always like calling it a death because you really did die. okay yeah 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 it was actually at age 15 in, in oh. this yeah right before 11th grade after 10th grade um um and I would graduate early. I just turned 17 when I graduated, so uh, got put in the year. But it was 15, so I uh, had already uh, really mastered the out of bodies and dreams after having them forced on me for years. I learned how to observe them, acknowledge them, and then control them. So by 15, uh, what became like a graduation of sorts was the near-death experience. And uh, I was an expert swimmer, I swam water polo and straight swimming. I jumped into a lake, uh, and I was a track. I could jump, basketball player, so I jumped up high. I came down feet first because of an ear infection. Got stuck in the muck underneath the dock, as other swimmers and track stars had in the past. Um, could not get out. And we used to swim in dams, waterfalls, during a flash flood, so we were strong swimmers. And uh, in those kind of states, Ohio and stuff, like that's just, you know, you're outdoor type of people. And... Uh, so swimming and swimming was uh, like a shark. Couldn't get out. Um, gulped in huge trash cans full of water all at once. Filled up like you see in the movies where the person fills up. Mm -hmm. Fell down with my yeah. Fell down with my knee still stuck in. I slowly died and was able to uh, stoically observe and record and remember everything. Because uh, there's literally nothing to, else to do except wait there and hope that someone splashed through the water and came down and saw me, but no one ever did. So uh, I watched it's the same thing as if you softly flo uh, falling asleep, um, and you could like the level of consciousness was more uh, like where you were semi-conscious. Mm -hmm. 
you know, maybe under some kind of anesthetic like that. But you could see what was happening, but you could tell that the, the lack of, uh, of focus and physical control was getting less. And uh, so I saw that I was going down into a, a lower level consciousness that would lead to like a, <clears throat> what I knew, and you can sense, like the, uh, when the person dies, they first struggle for life and death. And then uh, after a point, uh, they experience pain during their struggle. And then uh, after another point, everything shuts off. Any kind of physical pain, I was freezing on the bottom of that lake, it shut off, right, all at once. And I got a warm, cozy feeling. So I still had the physical sensations, but uh, uh, the struggle for life and death uh, is usually over when the pain level suddenly stops. And uh, then you acknowledge that, shit, I can't, I, it's, I'm going to die. And you realize inside this primal fear uh, rises up then, where you realize automatically I'm going to die. Just like if someone has uh, a heart attack or a poison in the body. If something comes along to them that something is not right and I'm going to die, you realize it inside and you know it's right. So uh, that's when uh, you acknowledge it and the struggle for life just stops. Then it's death itself. And uh, if you're lucky well, or unlucky, depending on how you die, you get to see it happening. I was able to see it happening. And uh, most six out of four people die by swimming and then heart attacks and comas or kind of half and half with that. Those are about the same. But uh, they say 700 people a day now uh, are having near-death experience because the hospitals are used to pulling them back, resuscitating them. <laughs> and um, so some even hours and some even, uh, there's a few even days later. There's a difference between resuscitation and resurrection, uh, especially a person that's a permanent death. And everyone wants to live after death. No one wants to die. But the, uh, during the death process, it becomes a part where you say, because you might be by yourself, I say, hey, this is going to happen, I'm going to die. You can feel it. Not only can you feel a pulling sensation, what it feels like to be a magnetic pull, and it is because it's your astral beginning, getting ready to separate from your physical. So there's an electromagnetic pull. Uh, a, a lot of people say they experience the tunnel. You do. The tunnel is actually the, the feeling that one experiences when their astral body is getting ready to come out of the physical. Uh, it's it's really instead of being pulled into the tunnel, you're really coming out of uh, the tunnel, which is your body. You might come out of your head, or just fully out of your full body. But there's a separation process process that happens naturally and involuntarily just like a leaf falls from a tree in the reverse way the spirit body loosens from the physical and floats naturally upward and it feels naturally without fear or anything it should be just like swimming even softer because it's thought actuated too you can physically control it but you can also say i want to turn my body upside down and it'll spin so that's uh or i want to float backwards you know, at a certain angle, and that's, or go upward. So um, you get used to that thought actuation thing uh, after death. So uh, the person naturally separates. They cannot control it. Your body will come out of the physical, whether you're awake or not. And this is uh, uh, what you, you'd love to see it awake happening. But usually half the time, the person pops awake about, we found eight, 15 to 22 seconds after they expire fully. When the heart stops, and it will stop at the same time that the hearing stops, uh, then when the heart, in which is the electromagnetic center of the body and of the spiritual uh, life force, when that life force cuts off from the heart, which would be like the battery or motor, when that stops, then you're out. They might be able to restart it, but then you're out, and that full separation begins. So most people wake up about 15 feet less than a basketball hoop, or about the size, height of a basketball, above their body. And it takes about 15, 22 seconds for the spirit body to come out, then you float upward. And then you realize, uh, there's, a real, there's a realization of time and space. You realize that, wait a second, I exist somewhere in time and space, and I had enough outer bodies. The near death is a spiritual outer bodies. After about, what, 10, 11,000, I had enough out of 12,000 to realize that I'm somewhere in time and space. And as I, I, get to, I get to see my spirit body rematerializing into an invisibly solid uh, uh, spiritual body, 
and, and just from a, like a teeming essence. The book fully describes it like no other book in, in the world. So you, the person, person's spirit body comes out in uh, a teeming essence type of form, like this fizz from a ginger ale. Mm-hmm. And then it rematerializes into a duplicate of itself, which is the real you, into a sub- solidly invisible form. Um, you then realize, you real, the realization of time and space, you realize that you are, and then you're, that, that you are, that's the kind of time. But the space, you look to see around, to see where you are, and you see your dead body. And that reminds you that, damn, I just had a heart attack. Then you realize, but wait, I'm still alive. And then there's a, uh, usually, uh, you, you may have a, a brief period to look around and observe your surroundings, which is interesting too. But a lot of times you're then, you don't go there, or you might go there without realizing, but you find yourself in, you're suddenly in uh, a life review type of uh, setting. And there is a certain order in this. A lot of people, because of their lapses of consciousness, like, uh, in fact, in any spiritual experience, uh, say like a near-death or UFO, when something happens and then suddenly you wake up or find yourself in another location doing another thing, that's a lapse of consciousness, especially in dreams, too. And it's those breathings that will connect those lapses, that it will be a continuity, there will be a single stream of in- uninterrupted memory of what you did, what you did, what you did, what you did. And in dreams, there's a way to remember that. Um, but uh, getting back to uh, you're drowning. The near death. So the person wakes up uh, about 15 feet out of their body, and once you're out of your body, within there, there's a, a, a what Muldoon, the 1920s guy, called a cord reach activity, and just like that silver cord that extends to you uh, when you're in out of body form, uh, the holy books describe it as a silver cord. It's like a an umbilical, umbilical cord, a spiritual umbilical cord that is attached to you when you're alive so that if you stay out in out-of-body form too long, it'll gently pull you back into your body. And if you resist the pull, it'll pull you harder. One time I got yanked out of the sky back in and woke up with a slight headache, um, but I was all right. So, um, But once you're far away enough from your body, because there's still a magnetic pull, that physical body wants to live. And also, when you're in out-of-body form, you'll realize, especially if you're doing it during a dream where you're still alive, you'll see yourself breathing. And you can feel your physical body in your invisible spirit body just 15 feet floating away. So there's a dual consciousness, just like people on the operating table. When they're out-of-body up near the ceiling, they see the doctor sawing on them. And there's no emotion with it. They observe it like you would some kind of TV play. But they can feel the saw. It doesn't really hurt them. They can feel the saw of where the doctor's cutting their physical body in their spiritual body. And they can hear the doctors physically in their physical body, what they're saying, and look up. So you're in both bodies, mentally and physically, at the same time. If if one of the doctors puts a hand on your shoulder during the surgery, you can feel it physically and spiritually. So that's, and there's also a dual consciousness too. So that's interesting. We talked about that a lot in the book. Um, person, they realize they're dead. Uh, and they realize that I'm in a different time, a different space, and the, the space of the afterlife or astral plane and the time, time of death. The person is then usually finds himself in a life review room, a lot of times floating in midair like I was. It's like a, a tire-sized room. They call it a room, although there's no ceiling and no floor. And the, the float, anytime you're floating, that's a sign of a dream dimension or astral dimension. Like if you uh, are having a, an experience, a, a spiritual experience, and you jump up in the air and come down slowly, you're, in, you're not in the real world. Um, there are other things like the vision, visionary things, too. Like you could look at something and see far, far away. Suppose you were, uh, wanted to see what was happening inside your house, but you were in uh, Oregon. You could just look in the direction north, and you'd see exactly right through the window what you want to see. The vision is good. Um, so uh, a lot of what the person's intentions are when they come into those realms is what they'll get. And the higher, the better. Like if a person wants knowledge, they'll go into a realm that is just will give them, and you absorb it. Or you can, you know, be taught it um, too. But it's best 
we, we can absorb the cosmic knowledge and the cosmic energy. And uh, uh, again, the breathings and meditation and the focus part of it. So see, when you do those breathings and you count them, that helps your, your, you to crystalline your focus, where you only focus on one thing, and, and then you begin to merge in with that thing. When concentrated focus, highly concentrated focus that develops through breathing exercises, uh, enables and naturally enables the person to merge into the essence of another person, place, or thing. So if someone's talking to you, a salesman, let's say, or a, a guy's talking to a girl for a date, and she does silently does her breathing exercises while looking at this guy talking to her, the words, the volume of his words begin to dim down, and his true intentions, nature, character, and stuff is revealed to her, to her mind and to her feelings. And as he's talking, his words are dimmed down in the reality of what he really wants to see. So, uh, like when I say do those breathings, you really should. And for I did them for sports because they make you super healthy and super strong, fast. Bruce Lee, Mike Tyson. But the other uh, things about them, like you can see right through people. You can see what they're really thinking. You can literally, like there would be some people talking to me or trying to convince me into something, and I would talk to their inner mind and have the and, and and say let's just stop this idea. Right? Have the inner dialogue with their mind while they'd be physically talking to uh, me. You know, I was really talking to their subconscious. So there's a lot of in in a lot of lot of things to learn and know, uh, except for just like uh, you know, uh, bending spoons or, or reading people's mm -hmm. names or or that talking to the dead. That's a that's some. So, uh, not say it does exist, but there's sort of higher levels of learning and knowledge and understanding. Especially if you decide I'm going to use it like this for good things, either for good for myself, my family, or for others, or just for me and God. It's uh, your intentions and your desire can those two can trump anything else. Like if you, there's a lot to want. Like you know, some people just want full health. Some people want you know whatever you want in this world you can get, and in the astral invisible world you can get it immediately there like you want an apple in your hand you can do the same thing here but it takes longer because of the repercussions of getting what you want a lot of people change their mind or decide you know that's not what they want and once you have it here you have to keep it um like like suppose the person i wish you were dead a person says that in anger in the astral world it wouldn't matter because you know that you don't you're not going to die mm -hmm. and you won't really feel pain but here if you got those wishes immediately the mother or the husband, whoever would be dead. So uh, God slows down the speed of return when a person wants to manifest something. And still, the, the higher you get into those levels, you get tired of manifesting just things you know, that people get jealous of or that you lose. And then you seek like higher things like full health or happiness or understanding like wisdom. There's so many like things to know or true peace like with other people. There's a lot of people having a really good life because those are like things that they want. And uh, there's a lot of people having a miserable time. Like two twins, one's super successful, handsome and everything. The other's some broken down alcoholic. And it's all because of how they think inside, how they picture themselves and what they want in life. And it's, uh, but the lifetime goes short. And so it's, we got to pick well and then also pick who we deal with well. Because people are really tripping out now, and uh, it's good to love them, but it's not always good to fully trust them. Yeah, trust, or, is, you know. a, trust is an interesting uh, dilemma all in itself. And um, you know, I've I've learned to basically uh, go with my gut feeling on trust, and it's mm -hmm. it's been serving me quite well for the last year or so. It's uh, I just when negative people come towards me, I can, I perceive it coming. And I just let them let them drift by, and then I cut myself off from anything that's uh, overly negative. Eugene, when you so when you um, passed over, um, describe what it looked like when you left your body. What what were the uh, what did it what did it look like? What did you see? And then okay. why did you come back in your body? Okay. Um, I'll do the second one first, a question, why did I come back? Because uh, it sounds like, uh, and I can easily answer, yeah, the mechanics of what I saw as the death was occurring, that's what you wanted? Yeah, yeah. Would... Okay, I'll, 
Well, well, I, I, well I, we, we kind of yeah, went through the mechanics of the death um, with okay. all the, the water and it, kind of the gross water and stuff you swallowed. But what happened after you kind of looked at yourself from the outside floating there or stuck in the mud? Okay. Okay. All right. I'll go to that first because there's more to that than just uh, explaining what happened. Okay. But as far um, so yeah, um, okay, so uh, the person after they, the reala- realization of time and space and they are aware that they exist outside their body, uh, a lot of times they're taken, after uh, a lot of times there's a brief excursion where you're uh, given some uh, free reign to float about and observe your surroundings. Some people say that they see, uh, uh, often there's a beach type of setting where the person is just like that movie Contact. Uh, there's some people who say they meet their family members, um, uh, and there are uh, or beautiful scenic cities. Um, then, um, uh, often though, in reality, there's our illusions. Um, you can experience the presence of your loved ones, just like you said about the feelings. And you and I both had that law enforcement thing, and we know that. Your gut feelings are ten times more safer than some book or some uh, rule or whatever. It's, or especially when dealing with people, it's so easy to go with your feelings because you just, like a spider said, you just naturally know this clown is crazy. And so, uh, in those things, it's better to go with the feelings. Your feelings won't. When the hairs on the back of your neck stand up, you know that they're they're in, they're doing it in your protection. So, um, okay, so. Um, so where was I? Um, oh, we were talking. Uh, okay, so I, I know it's but no, right, I, I, right near the life. Well, I'll start with the life review because the person is just like transported. Once you realize that, wait, I'm alive. It's after death. I can see my dead body. I did die, but I'm awake again, and I actually feel in the prime of my life. Like uh, some people say, you're over fifty. They they report the person coming back feeling like a thirty-three year old. Uh, if you die young, you might come back at the same age. But it's an interesting thing when you're fully conscious in the after-death uh, world. The first thing, you're, you're, you're super happy. Even though you saw that, that I just died, even though the, the real me is actually still awake and I'm not dead. Then comes the life review, where the person's life, in a three-dimensional way, usually on flat screen type of surfaces, is uh, shown to them, just like a deck of cords where you can see all images all at once. And uh, one screen shows everything you ever said, everything you ever thought, everything you ever did, and how you felt when you were, spirit, were doing those things, and how the person, good or bad, that you affected, how they felt, whether they were happy, you gave your mom a present, or whether they were sad, some girl broke up with her boyfriend. You get to feel all the... Uh, 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 results of what you did throughout your whole life, uh, good or bad, all at once, multidimensionally, you feel it. And as you're floating in the air, uh, in what would be like a revolving uh, wheel, and uh, that was interesting too, James. Uh, uh, so uh, there are a lot of things so interesting in the afterlife uh, experience that I went to, and luckily, as fate would have it, the world authority, Dr. David Jacobs, would be in Philadelphia and work at the same campus that I worked at. I worked with the police, he worked with the history. And so I walked right over to his building one day to ask him some questions about the questions I had about my near death. I wanted to see if he kind of felt the same way. And he did 100%. So I started working with him one-on-one for 12 years uh, because I saw some anomalies that uh, just suspicious. But um, life review. Um, And this is why the person wants consciousness. The more conscious you are in real life, the more conscious you'll be in your spiritual life, even more so because you're you're multi, you have multidimensional consciousness. And if you have, when you have a uh, best way to have a spiritual experience is through a dream. You can have that tonight. And the desire is usually the best way. And the better health you're in, like the straighter you go to sleep, the more you can have it. And once you start focusing on anything, especially a, a, a spiritual goal, it, once the focus becomes just that, like that thing where you only want that hair because the clown's holding your neck down, you'll get it, and you'll get it fast. Um, so you want the person wants to, to get those. The person wants the desire of a prisoner or of an addict, or of some power-hungry queen or king. You want 
the more you want, the desires are, can almost trump anything except the intentions uh, in those uh, levels. But because the more you feel for something, the more it uh, hurtles towards you. And when you add a uh, focus, a, a single, most people don't know what they want, even when you ask them. So when you have a specific thing in mind, then you emotionally feel it. It hurtles towards you. You have to be careful what you ask for them. But getting back to the near death, so uh, the person is uh, is shown the life review so that uh, there can be no mistaking uh, 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 the judgment that is about to be to uh, proceed. And everyone has heard that there's some kind of judgment, and uh, it's not the old kind of judgment. You're going to be struck by lightning. Uh, there is a and and you're shown your entire life so that there can be no mistaking, and you, as you were just shown exactly everything you did. No mistaking when uh, the controller that the scientists call him, or what we would call God, comes to you. And he will come to you in a way that you will understand him as. Like a kid may see an old old grandpa figure in a rocking chair. Uh, uh, someone else may see, a, a, like some people may see a sphere shape, what they call spheres of consciousness. I saw them. Um, and someone else may, a female uh a feminist might see a, a female a god. So, but it will be God to you, and God will come to you as no person can go to God. It would take too many lifetimes, <laughs> and they still couldn't do it. So God comes to the person. Uh, God, after the life review, God is good enough to forgive. These are some of the stages to forgive the person first. And uh, there are various colors. Colors are really important. That's why I say no one talks about the white lights that come after these stages. So uh, He forgives you. Uh, uh, and in mine, there were two primary colors, orange and red, one for the full healing, and then the other for God's permanent forgiveness, because he's a good God. Uh, uh, and the way that you see him as is not is the way he will be, but ten times more. And uh, that's why uh, in the Bible, in, in all, the belief is so important that Jesus himself uh, specifically... Uh, exhorted the people to fully believe because in that world if you believe <laughs> some kind of so you want your afterlife belief and in, 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 you want your beliefs to carry over from physical to the uh, interdimensional uh, because there is a God and uh, you get according to what you believe he's a good God and he is God like he can control he can decide if you live exist or perish so God comes and it's that time you've been forgiven You've been allowed, like, say, a Hitler. God acknowledges what you did, and he's big enough to adjust that in some way or the other. But the primary thing, and this has always been said, was if you believe in him. That's where the, uh, an emotional component uh, seemed to come out with the controller. Why, you know, where a person, a scientist might think, well, why doesn't he just judge me on my merits or my misbehaviors? Where does the belief, why do I have to believe, give the energy of belief to him, so that's like an emotional component where it shows that the God is maybe more than what is surmised, or or maybe less. So there were some uh, um, issues with the control factor of uh, what we would call God. The scientists, uh, privately and publicly, uh, uh, were uh, uh, worried about it, and so was I. You know. Um, uh, um, it was like a the control aspect, you know, as you're floating in midair, arms stretched out as though you might be on a cross, uh, in a lot of them. There was no, uh, nothing uh, in any kind of negative way. The control was complete, but soft and gentle, the kind that a person would yield to in the nirvanic, uh, 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 heaven or nirvanic and blissful stages, which are actually a part of... Uh, uh, of going up, there are about twelve stages. We're about at stage number five or six. So anyway, uh, so when we you, get the, when uh, you say stages, not like when you say number five or six. Some people, um, I would, well, I call them. Uh, uh, what do I call them? Um, we are in the the fourth uh, dimension, the big dimensional or stages. Dimen yeah. So some people yeah. say we're in the, you know, going from the fourth to the fifth or the fifth to the sixth. But when you get up into the Eighth, ninth, tenth. We don't have a body anymore. It's we're all just pure light. Is that kind of the, uh, how you see it too? Yeah, 
Yeah, see, um, yeah, the higher we go, the more finer we get until we're literally just a, a speck of conscious, a thought of conscious. A lot of times a person will have an out of body and they seem just to be a pinpoint of consciousness up, up in the corner of a room. That's like a, a very high uh, way. Um, and also there's a, a merging part. Uh, this is even before you meet God. This is during the white lights where the person disintegrates completely. There's a scene in that movie Pocahontas where she merges into the wind. It's a perfect scene. I've shown them. And that's what happens. There's a spirit disintegration which happens during the white lights. So white, there's a lot of things that happen in the white lights. And one of the things uh, that happens is a spirit disintegration where and whenever there's a change in the physiology of a spirit body, there's also a change in one's level of consciousness and a change in dimensional space-time. So if the person sees... So whenever a person's uh, spirit body changes or their level of consciousness changes, they're aware that they're on a different dimension. So uh, a different dimension is a different thing than a level of consciousness because a level of consciousness is an awareness and a different dimension is a, uh, a space. It's a locational thing. So when you change your level of consciousness, when you change your level of awareness, uh, your your, uh, your spiritual body will also change because it has to. Because when you change one of those things, there will also be a level a change in dimensional space and time. So then you can learn how to control where you can go by changing your thoughts or changing your, the physiology of your spirit body. And usually by changing your thoughts first, then the physiology will follow. And then at the same time, acting as a triad, the location or distance, the time and space thing will change to according to your so one can see that's where the thoughts are super important and the controlling of, of them uh, I used to imagine myself uh, <laughs> so you can imagine yourself any like the top of a mountain so that's why uh, a lot of times you'll see those those you'll see the image of a mystic or a monk sitting up in some high uh, uh, mountain where you're just uh, staring off into the distance he's so in that inner world that uh he's really his spirit body is fully uh doing something there and his physical is just sitting there. it's just a bezel to come back into like a coat mm -hmm. but um there's a lot there's way more out there than there is here and you can interact when you're in the spiritual form you can interact with the world easier than you can physically to interact with the spiritual world but uh it, it, um well, we, so well, there's a go ahead, but we, yeah, there's a difference between like dimensions and stages because stages has more to do with a uh, level of consciousness. Dimensions is actually a place where you can go to or send yourself to by controlling your thoughts. Um, and when you when you control your thoughts and your uh, emotions, then your body, physical, your spiritual body will change. And when you when those two things happen automatically, acting in a triadish way then your level of consciousness, your location will change, especially if you know where you want to go. We were talking about that earlier. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so when you, when you, fl when you flipped, when you went up, so you, you <laughs> when you went up, when I flipped burger, you know, when you flipped, when you, you left your body, you go to the up, you, you went up, you met, um, what you believe is God source energy. Yeah. Um, and they had, and that was like describe that. I think you described it once like a a ball of light that came over you were on a beach and this thing had come towards you. Is that correct? Yeah, that yeah, that was the uh in spiritual form, the approaching of God uh was seen uh uh physically through the spirit in the spirit vision. And I seen it as a sun it looked like the sun was uh, on the horizon rising. Without seeing it move, James, it went from uh, the, the nine o'clock position uh, to uh, ten o'clock, then two o'clock, and then it was about half a football field, half a soccer field from me. As I floated in the air at the same level. Now, as it rose in the air, uh, my uh, spirit body altered and rose with it, um, suggesting uh, uh, either uh, like a. a, a like a coordinated relationship to it or a union relation or a controlling type thing. But I rose in unison, not on my own volition, with it, and uh, until we were 50, you know, half a football field face-to-face -face with each other. When they say, like, you should meet God in the sky face-to-face, that stuff. And, uh, see, I didn't have any kind of either. 
any religious deprogramming like that. A lot of people seem to think, uh, and I was moving the phone around, a lot of people seem to think that, uh, uh, you know, that the prehistory of religious going to church and stuff like that, that has nothing to do with it. Uh, if people in heroin had nothing to do with it, it, this trumps every kind of reality. So uh, the emerging thing, and they don't they don't mention that. The so things that they don't mention that means they don't know about. Because if you when you know things, you're going to talk about them, unless you're purposely trying to not reveal everything. Like I have to, a lot of times. And Stevie Nicks. <laughs> but but um, so the person. Uh, God comes through the person. Their spiritual body alters, and their, their thoughts and levels of consciousness. The purity of, of their thoughts and the body changes. Those red and orange lights uh, that heal and forgive you also cleanse and alter you to prepare you, uh, physically cleanse the dirty humans because of all kinds of thoughts, deeds, and, and, and you know, get over us. What can I get from God? Yeah. So they physically clean them uh, in preparation for a meeting with God. And you know you're being washed and stuff because your thinking is different. Your body is heart strong. And you can see that they're, that you're being washed and ready for something higher, something really high, because you're floating in air, too. And it feels normal. So uh, uh, but usually the person goes through the light, white lights as a final cleansing, a super spiritual cleansing. The white light is the strongest light of any of the spiritual colors and it has the strongest after effects that uh get stronger in you year after year after year for the rest of your natural life and uh this is when you're this is when the universal consciousness coming comes in and the the feeling that you're merging with the universe because you are this is where spirit disintegration comes in and this is where the beginning of nirvanic bliss and happiness which are illusions uh uh and the book two explains more about that um, because there's for every reality there's also a secondary uh, opposite and often illusionary reality and that holds same for the near death the life after death and the UFO abductions and uh, we saw that in the book the book is really good I should do a couple of quotes from it but um, so uh, throughout my near death throughout all these things uh, I was looking for the source, the power, the controlling thing behind it. And you can best observe something without emotions. And uh, I uh, used my feelings and my more than my physical. I recorded everything visually, but I used the feelings, especially later on when I reflected on it, to fully analyze exactly what had happened. You'll experience a dream, and then later on that day when you reflect upon the dream, a lot of times you'll see it in a different or slightly or more, you know, uh, 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 educated or more awake way. You'll understand it better on reflection, you know? Yeah. And so that's the same same thing with the, the near death. The near death is what it is, but it's way more than what it is. And uh, <laughs> it, so it is what it is, but it's way more than it is. That's kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, because, I mean, before, who could explain the near death? Uh, uh, better than me before uh, I came on the scene. I've been on the scene for 22 years. I work with the best world authorities. Uh, here's an uh, even Alexander said he had proof of heaven. All his colleagues in his field of research and the record came out against him for this, for this, for this, for medical reasons, for this, for not. You know, no one's come out against me because I worked with their superiors. I worked with the world authorities in their own fields and the, went above their heads. Yeah, and it's talk, exactly right. Talk it's about the detail, James. Yeah, you talk, you know, after you had this near-death experience, um, you actually went through a heck of a lot of tests um, in in uh, some, basically you're, uh, you're in some scientific journals and things like that, too. You've, uh, you know, you had... Uh, you've been studied. You, they basically, university kind of showed up and said, okay, come over here. You think you had a near-death experience? Well, we're going to plug you into whatever machine and or, or do whatever they did. What did they do to um, verify that this is what really happened? Yeah, just like uh, a lot of times, like when someone, like with me, because I've done it a lot of times with people, uh, and with Dr. J, I've seen him. So, and with the near-death. So, uh, if you know your subject well, 
like say you with the, uh, the Mounties, you know? Uh, suppose you came upon someone, yeah, hey, James, I used to be a Mountie too. You could ask him four to six questions and ascertain whether he really was, don't you think? Oh, yeah. Yes. So uh, the same with uh, any kind of, uh, especially a world authority, where it's usually no one really gets to, you're selected, they invite you to work, you're, to work with like a, a world authority, even a scientist, especially a world authority, you have to be like selected, they have to know who you are, you have to actually have had a legitimate experience happening, happened, you have to be able to explain to them what happened in a clear, a concise, uh, scientific way. Um, you have to be able to have a good memory. You have to know their work inside and out. And so uh, anyone who gets with the science, anyone who, I was invited by Grayson. I thought he was like a regular college doctor, like the University of Connecticut or Penn State or whatever. So I, uh, I got, I, I accepted his invitation, then looked on, well, exactly who is he and what is this University of Virginia? It turns out he was the, like the dean of international near death. So instead of telling him, that I had a near death. Tell him, instead of telling him what happened, I said, let me tell him exactly what happened. After uh, some time and a warning from another world authority, it seemed like he was only interested in what he could extract from me. It would, he was like, he's like the Baron Frankenstein hmm. <laughs> of uh, <laughs> the near death research. I saw that. Also, um, I was warned to copyright my information because they would try to steal it. Someone would try to steal it, especially, and I had stuff they had never heard about, too, um, or even imagined. So uh, he did, uh, it was, it, Grayson did try to steal it. So it, I knew it in advance, because, I mean, how can you, uh, how can you trick a mystic? Yeah. And, and you know, <laughs> I'm going to steal from you. Yeah, okay. So I, I, I thought, I was warned by another will. And I said, let me test him. I didn't know that. I said, let me test him. Just like any, I used to work with the police. Said, let me give him reverse information and see if he, if he does steal it. To see if the other person was right about this. Because I believed it. Because I used to work in film, and they'll do it in film. So I figured, yeah, doctors. There was a near-death guy who uh, waterboarded his own daughters to try to get the information from them. <laughs> you know, the guy. Yeah, the guy in Delaware. So um, I put reverse information, and this is why, and sometimes you'll put information out, someone will steal it, and later you'll see it turn up in real life. Uh, so I told him, when a person dies, if they go into death with the mindset of being afraid, of being happy, or whatever, that will, mindset will prevail over death. And that's not true. That was the opposite of what's true. Uh, um so I put something also, and I gave them the length of time between death and life and reconsciousness after death. They didn't even have terms like reconsciousness after death. I had to make all those new terms up. And I, I made them up in a way where if any future researcher in the future were to try to uh, copyright my stuff and use it in this research, which we're fully always watching for, they would have to almost literally use the same definition because it's so precise or make up one so close that I would be able to see but no one has because they would have to back up what they say, and a lot of people just can't. Yeah. The experience love it because they, the experiences love it because they've gone through those things. But the scientists can't. Like if someone questions them about something that I've written in my book, there's no way they, they can fill in uh, what it is. It would take them 30 years to just understand it. But the experiences, because a lot of them have had these things happen, automatically recognize it. Um, but we were talking. What were we talking about that? There's so many things, like you said, the merging part is really interesting. You can merge into a fellow person as well as merging with, with God. Um, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Um, so you went to, you got studied by this Bruce Grayson guy, oh, yeah. Dr. Bruce Grayson. Um, and yeah, that, and uh, was, all Atwater, uh, near-death experience uh, person. Yeah. Yes. See, uh, uh, there's like a... There's like formal research, informal research, and then casual or personal. Uh, with uh, Grace, it was the formal type, which everyone likes. You want to be invited by the white lab coat guy, fully invited with paper. Uh, it was a personality study slash near-death uh, questionnaire, which would be followed up by interviews. You go down there, they, they assess your personality, da-da-da-da. 
uh, and then, but mainly to see what happened. The questions were really interesting, and to see what you, what information could be yielded from the subjects, who were then to be subject number 49, a case B. Mm-hmm. The subjects would not get any uh, attention, which I didn't care about back then. And really, when they work with the scientists, none of them do. They're just thrilled to be working with Grayson, Atwater, or Jacobs. That they don't care, yeah, sign it, yeah, do whatever. Sign your life away. But uh, the value, information is so valuable that the, uh, if Grayson is a good one, like he'll take the information and then write journal books or, or you know, figure out psychologically what's happening. But some of them just quickly go and write books and they're seen on Oprah uh, talking about, uh, you know, da 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 da. And the experiencers never get none of that. And they're only half right. They, you know, if you go, you know, they make it look like they've solved something. Really, they just reiterated what some subject from Georgia said, but never got the credit. So now the experiences are learning to keep their own data, at least till they understand it. Like, I didn't talk about my stuff for about 40 years. Because first, you weren't allowed to when we were kids. And then uh, mine was so different. I said, I don't see like Elvis and stuff like that. Hmm. I didn't see no one after death except God and, and spirit. I didn't see people walking around like that. And, uh, yeah, you had, so, you uh, had the, yours was a private experience because I think everybody's is private. You, you like, yeah, it's that, a private that first personal. part. Yeah. That first part is going to be private. And if you end up staying there, yeah, you may send up, see a little bit more, but you weren't supposed to be there anyway. So when you're getting punted back, it's, uh, you never got past the waiting room. I went, um, into the merging, like a person, uh, the ultimate, it's the ultimate desire, even the ultimate natural inclination is to mix back in with where you're from. So in that spiritual realm, just like to go to the light, to go in that spiritual realm, the n- natural inclination is to mix into the source of everything because you're magnetically pulled there anyway. Uh, as the person goes into the white lights and they see their spirit body uh, uh, disintegrating, and they realize that they're going dimensionally into another location. That's where you can tell if you're uh, dimensionally traveling because there will be a slight lapse of consciousness or a immediate change of scenery or your spirit body will begin to change. And you can look at it and see the, the change in it. So when it changes from solidly invisible to, uh, to semi-speckled uh, and then to a te- teeming fine mist, those are spirit body changes that will result in the locational change. But you, it's harder. It's easier to change the location by changing your thoughts than it is to physically change the spirit body. It happens naturally. Just like if you pinch yourself, it'll be a change in your physical. So you have to. It all starts with some thoughts. But uh, there's a lot of. Uh, but yeah, the white lights, the merging, and once you uh, experience that merging process, which can uh, comes from full concentrated focus until you become one with it. They talk about because become one with it. You literally do. Like, a, I was staring at this squirrel because I saw that he was staring at me. <laughs> you know? I didn't like that. So. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, uh, this is, uh, I was in my like, late 30s. I shot into him. My spirit came, spontaneously came out of my body, and they're spontaneous out of bodies. I went into his psyche, James, saw him for a mega second, looking at me through his eyes, and then shot back into my body. And uh, that happens uh, after spiritual experiences. That stuff happens naturally. Like a, a cross country runners have been running and suddenly found themselves 22 feet over their body, seeing themselves run along the, the trail in the you know, woods with the other runners for a split second and then shoot back down. That started to happen. That started happening in junior high and, and uh, maybe from the teens to about the 30s. That's an interesting thing. So if you have spontaneous out of bodies and then. Uh, controlled out of bodies and uncontrolled out of bodies. The uncontrolled out of bodies, uh, a lot of times, are connected with uh, UFO incidents, and uh, that's a thing too. Yeah, let's get into your UFO issues you've had since then. Okay, <laughs> it's no, been a good one. So, uh, just to, and to recap, uh, Eugene Braxton um, and uh, the, the type of stuff that you've bumped into over time, Eugene is. The uh, is, is basically you drowned when you were 15. You you quote unquote died. You went up, uh, and because of your ability to remember all those out of body tra- uh, 
the experiences you had as a kid, you remembered everything of this out of body one, like it was an out of body uh, experience, and you went up to source energy, God, whatever anybody wants to put a name on it, and uh, was basically told, "Hey, buddy, off you go," and you ended up slamming back into your body and kicking yourself out, and your bu- and I guess even though it probably it probably seemed like you're gone a couple hours, it was probably a few seconds before you pop back up, but. Um, since then, and this is kind of interesting because a lot of my my psychic friends who have uh, had all sorts of reboots during their life over and over again, they've died numerous times, and they've and you know they do have that you know I've died, I went up, I got told it wasn't my time, got told to come back, and every time they they leave their body, they're getting an upgrade. Like they're on iOS 26 or something now, but they're uh, they come back and all of a sudden their psychic ability or whatever ability they had um, in the metaphysical is or, or parapsychological is now ramped right up. So you you had your thing when you were 15, and um, since then you've had some UFO or alien experiences. How? Like, wh- tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, um, so yeah, near death at 15. And uh, then the after effects of that, too. Uh, I won't, won't wish too much, but there were some after effects that at first were negative, like some neurological uh, uh, things where my arm was twitching, where I couldn't run track that, that next year, then exploded in 12th grade. Uh, and, and it, but, um, so near death at 15, then at 17, this is right around the time Plea with Mac came out, um, I was out of school and kind of went through like the, you know, because I was a year younger. I went to college, but still had like that difficult transition from teen to adult. Mm-hmm. So, and then uh, the family was in transition where dad had left, the younger brother was raising hell. And uh, mom was stressed out. I was working. So, uh, and then I was young, and I was having these background uh, psychic experiences all on top of that stuff. And as far as trying, trying to figure out who I was uh, and why these things were happening and how to control them, because I couldn't fully control them not till the 20s. So, uh, when I finally got the near death balanced out, and still they didn't, I graduated in 76. It wasn't until 78 where the term came out, 77 near death and people die so I realized that uh, something you know I always remembered what it was and and knew it was real but science didn't start talking about the late 70s so anyway uh, at age 19 I was driving with a friend in Kent and uh, Kent's like an Ohio and Pennsylvania super haunted places as other states are but uh, we were riding with a friend Roger uh, and we uh this was right around dusk, 8.15, 8 o'clock, you know, summer night. And we saw uh, one of the disc-shaped UFOs floating over a, football, a baseball field that everywhere they all play, Little League Baseball, the only the main baseball field in the town. I said, Roger, look. And we stopped the car, and I got out of the car and put my hands on the hood, sat, you know, through the window with my hands on the hood look, to get a full look. Time kind of froze. We could see car lights on the right of us, but they froze too. And then all focus was on this UFO. There was a a lapse of consciousness because the next thing we knew, the thing was soaring up, everything froze. Uh, And this was on a normal town street avenue where we should have cars every six seconds on both sides. And uh, no cars went, and that was rare for like a summer night in this town. It's a university town, a party town, and all that. So a college town. So uh, Roger and I both had some uh, interesting uh, after effects. Like I burst out crying a week for no reason after that. Um, dreams and, and out of bodies. But uh, so I had the near death, the UFO, and uh, then. Um, it's good when you have these experiences to not go and run and tell people, but to watch them for like between two months and two years afterwards, because they may lead to something else. Like the haunted house that we had in my thirties led to uh, 
uh, another UFO sighting. That would happen in Philly. This one was in Ohio. And uh, even back then, I had beget, begun to get into the spiritual, and I wanted more experiences. I had had, in conjunction with the uh, out-of-bodies and paralyzations and dreams as a kid, uh, uh, certain experiences that would be abduction-related dream experiences and semi-conscious experience to the extent where I knew that they were also uh, messing with the astral body. And I knew that back then, but now they're fully talk they're talking about it much more and normally. This is something that the UFO researchers, the good ones, the big ones, back in the 40s and 50s knew that they were doing. And even the FBI knew in 49. And today's researchers, where they're, <laughs> some of them, some of them literally looked like Dr. J and I was, Jacob, so I was trying to tell him, and he semi kind of understood that, look, there's a spiritual side to the UFOs, and he kind of only believes in the physical side, side where they come from, actual, in actual metal ships from actual rock planets. And I was telling him, like, look, how could they go through solid walls if they weren't spiritual? It's not a thing that happens in the world. So, um, with that UFO thing, I saw that they were working on the spirit body more so than on the spirit. You know, they would, uh, they might, have, like Barney and Betty Hill, who we knew, they would abduct them and, yeah, do it physically. But uh, the more clandestine way, the more sneaky way, the more where they can extract much more DNA and energy is by working with the spirit body. That's the housing of the soul and the soul's energy, which is what they really want and are really getting. That's why a person would go to sleep at 10 o'clock at night, wake up at 9 o'clock the next day and feel drained, because they were drained, uh, and, and uh, either blanked out or put in some kind of dream memory where they were running down the street holding hands with some alien. There's a, there's a super negative side to this. In the same way that there's a negative side to the near-death, that the researchers literally refuse to talk about it, um, there's a super negative side to the uh, UFO thing that today's researchers, it's like not in vogue to discuss. They're like, And Dr. J was one of them who saw some, the reality of some of the physical things happening. And when he talked about it, the other clowns kind of scorned him, scorned him out. And as one of the few, uh, even Mac noticed some disturbances. And the further back you go, Jung, Heineck, they knew these things were not happening. And they were suspicious. Uh, uh, sneaky, uh, uh, not truthful, you know, and this is not a cool, even in the churches and the religions of every religion say that these things are negative interdimensional beings that are literally harvesting off of us. And in essence, mystically, that is what they are. Because wow. uh, uh, during my sleep experiences and dream experience, all through the young years and the 20s and the teens and these things are uh, super, it's not cool. It's like the dark side of the UFO. And so they slide in as dreams. They slide in as sleep paralysis. When you have a dream where I was being held down or I couldn't run, those things, when you know more and experience, those, there's a lot of things that we think are innocent that are not so innocent. And they come invisibly. They come through the night. They come, they work on the astral body. That's what they want. They want, here's what they want, eternal soul. They want eternal life, and they can get it through the energy of the human being soul, which is so powerful that it can carry a human uh, throughout eternity. They know that and can get it. It's in one interview where the lady asked me, how do you think that they get it? And uh, she said, spiritually, electromagnetically. And, uh, yeah, it would be done through the, the spirit, and, and which is electromagnetic in nature and also an osmosis absorb, absorption process which is done through direct thought and, and with a mixture of focus willpower and desire there's a lot of deep interesting it's a fascinating field to work in both of them and some one person said why do you work in the near death and the UFO because they're intricately interwoven especially when you understand the reality of the near death uh, and then you can see better into the UFO. Like Dr. J, he said, I know nothing about near death, and he didn't. And I questioned the UFO, the near death world authorities. They knew very little about the uh, uh, 
uh, UFOs. And NDE guys didn't know much about the UFO, not like the UFO experts. And the, but the public knew more about both subjects than I, the doctors do. That's why it's best to have a, a researcher, doctor, experiencer like PMH Atwater, who has actually died. And her, uh, her uh, research advanced near death from the late 70s to the 90s to the 2000s. Super. She, it would have died without her. And now my research is doing the second thing. And she is the one who brought me in to make sure I had a fair and even shot. Okay. Because she had to perch her way into it. So it's a deep thing, but it's so valuable. All that. Because just like you said, I want to learn you know, so much, so much when I was a kid. The more you want to know, it'll come to you. All you have to do is know exactly what you want. Most people don't know what they want. You know, that's when you know what you want, you get it quick. Do you do you uh, have a tendency to see spirits too? I've seen some. Yeah, when I started out, all my experiences were inner, and after a while, I said I want to have some outer stuff happening. After I was older, cemented, you know, 24, 25, I had had some outer stuff happen. I want to really have, I want to see chairs move across. So uh, it did start. Um, I was various uh, levels of conscious from fully straight to uh, angry, depressed, or to partied out. Uh, I, I, I have seen things like I've seen shadow people. I've seen, one time I was laying on my back, I seen what looked like uh, Two uh, little, smir three little smurfs. I swear they were dancing and skipping right across my chest. And it looked in front of 3D cartoon animation. I said, "What the hell is this?" And they were so I let them skip across. And as soon as they got to the other side of my chest, they kind of just disappeared into those things. But when you see those things, you do let them happen because once you fully start to, once your conscious mind starts to focus, a lot of times they'll dissolve and go away. So you have to kind of just let yourself hang in that altered state temp for a few seconds and just like when you see those shadow beings like uh, i was watching tv late one night cable and uh on at the, on the corner of my eye i've seen something running across i could see the feet literally running you know against the baseboard the white and when i looked down it was gone i said shit because i had seen that before i said all right i'm going to pretend to watch the screen again and when i see it running this time i'll just look with the peripheral and I'll be damned if it didn't go down the other baseboard, going the other way in the room, and run. And if you look with the peripheral, not straight on, you'll be able to see them. And I thought that was, I had heard of them. I didn't believe them when I used to hear them on Art Bell and stuff, but I saw that they were real in, when was this? Yeah, the early 2000s. I was like, I wanted that outside physical stuff to happen. Started too. Yeah. But with the, uh, it's when the potion focuses on something. That's where that merging, the focus and the merging are, are brother and sister. Because when you focus on something so much, you become to become, you do become with, one with it, mentally or physically. And uh, they, they don't know, but that's another thing that they need to talk about. And I will talk about more. And you do. You're a chatty, <laughs> you're a chatty young man. <laughs> yeah, well... Um, well, thanks, Tim. Yeah, and if and, and if anyone's looking for his book, uh, American Mystic Solves Near Death Riddle, uh, you can find that on Amazon or just Google it. American Mystic Solves Near Death Riddle, and it'll pop it up. It's very very interesting. It's a, it's an a, an interesting life you've had. Of course, we all you know you grow up, you have a family, and and things go on, and. Um, from somebody who is literally found on a snowy church um, step as a baby and and put up for adoption. That's, you know, it, it, you've, you've had your own challenges before you even knew they were challenges. I wonder if they were even challenges. You were just kind of uh, gifted. You were gifted a very, very interesting. I'd love to know more about, you know, hindsight. You'd love to know where you get this ability from, but you can't, right? You'll never know. It's, it's, I think... Uh like one um, uh, Dr. Ring, the n near death guy, uh, one of the near death world authorities, he's one of the ones who sat with Oprah. While Grayson, the actual white coat lab guy, the Peter Cushing, was fully working. <laughs> I told him, I said, I said, Grayson's working 24 7, Ring's sitting with Oprah. Yeah, I just told him that to make him mad. But Yeah, it's, it's, And uh, James, what, did, what was, sorry, what was the question? Uh, it wasn't a question, was it was a comment. Uh, but it, it, well, other than you, it's, it's too bad you couldn't find out. Um, where you get this ability to easily connect oh, to yes. the side. I do. Oh, I do. I asked for it. 
Oh, you I, did. yeah, I know. I know. Oh, yeah. sweet. Yeah. Yeah, I asked for it when I was nine. I asked God, and I, you know, when kids are, they really believe and they really are sincere. So I asked God. I was walking home, and the winds were blowing the tree in front of our backyard. We lived in one of those silly alleys where, you know, there's a row of homes. So uh, pretty nice, though. Um, so I uh, saw it was a nice, breezy, bloomy day. So I said, God, if you'll show me all these invisible things in the invisible world, more than any man or king knows, then I'll always tell people about you. I promise. Uh, if you give me, tell, show me all the things that more than anyone who ever lived ever knows, I'll tell people about you all the time. And I swore he kept his promise, and I kept mine. And uh, so that's where, and then, you know, that's when it really, I always wanted those things, and I knew that God could let me know if I asked him. And I made him, I swear, I will tell people about because I knew that if he showed me those things, I knew that he would be real. And it says you're allowed to test God, like Moses tested God. He wanted to see it, and, and God showed him himself. If you want to test God, you're allowed to. He welcomes it. God doesn't force this stuff on you. Like people, you shouldn't believe in God. You shouldn't. And they, they see what, what kind of condition the world is. But God gives you almost anything you want for free, and he's already helped you fully, and you still don't believe. Those kind of people are like, it's you you just feel bad and you really shouldn't even it sounds you shouldn't even involve yourself with people who are not in with god or the higher thing or in a positive way cuz it's just too much darkness in the world just like a spiritual battle between good and evil and it's a serious one and uh people realize that there are invisible things affecting people who are just freaking out you know taking axes and axing the whole family but you know just raping animals and stuff you know yeah. In on the front steps of their own house, the cops had to pull this clown off. So uh, there's something affecting us more than just these five uh, G uh, t- towers. It's a, a yeah, battle for the soul. Yeah, there's some stuff going on um, on a much deeper connected side than than we are aware of it at this point. Uh, things are changing, and I think people who are a little bit more sensitive to the other side are are being allowed to see um a little bit i have friends of mine who are allowed now why well, not allowed but they've they've seen horrible horrible things in the future coming if yeah. we don't get our collective shit together and um and start living with the earth and, and quit living off of the earth and fracking yeah. and mining and and pushing people around it's uh, you know, we're we're damaging the planet we live on, and the planet we live on is going to—it's well, already got its back up, and she's going to bite us in the ass. And it's a—you uh, know, there's there's some very uh, geotechnical things that uh, are on the, in the future, and uh, let's keep hoping they keep getting pushed back further and further and further, as long as we have a conscious effort to try to keep the planet in in working order. Uh, because it's uh, getting to the point where it's going to just shake its. It's like a. It's going to be like a dog shaking its, uh, shaking itself and flicking the fleas around because uh, us yeah. fleas are driving this planet crazy and it's just going to get rid of us. And uh, the few people are going to stick around and um, and but a lot are not. They're going to be. Uh, it's going to be a cleansing. <laughs> Yeah. I don't. I don't think it's going to be. Well, a, I don't think it's. it's true. Going, I don't think it's going to be a flood kind of cleansing where everyone got cleaned except uh, one family. But uh, you know, it, it's it's about time we had a good. Uh, this planet needs an enema. Yeah. 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 A pinpoint cleansing where, you know, laser beam points uh, will be. They'll just be gone in the twinkling of an eye. Oh, it's going to be bigger than that. Uh, yeah, this, mm-hmm. It's going to be. Like, oh, you live on the west coast. Oh, I hope you're 200 feet above sea level. What? What do you mean by that? Yeah, I really. God, yeah, I, yeah I, and, I, I'm bad vibes from that. Yeah, yeah. M- move to Arizona, and uh, you might get some good beachside property in a couple of years. So who knows? Um, yeah, Eugene Braxton. Oh. This is interesting, and um, I know we have we have a, ten- a tendency we. 
um, because sometimes I do it, but we free think and, and, um, when I ask you a question, you answer it and then you, you build up around it and build up around it and build up around it. And I know you, so it's, uh, I've talked to you before and it's either one of us is usually doing all of the talking. So I let you run today. And I'm going to have you back, and then I'm going to do all the talk. No, I better not do that. But we're going to talk a little bit more about. Um, I'd like to get get you in and uh, and keep you know keep in touch with you and, and see how everything's going. Especially if you're bouncing around any more UFOs or um, you're getting any uh, visitations uh, from spirit, from angels, from uh, a ghost. Who the heck knows? Let me know, and uh, we'll have a chat about it. Um, but it's been really nice to talk to you again. I, like I say, it hasn't. It's been like a couple of years since we uh, got together, and I know it's kind of hard because you know you've you've told these stories over and over and over and over again. I guess to a point where it's like, oh, okay, what did I miss or what? Did I, if but uh, again, if anyone wants to look at his book, um, the American Mystic solves a near death riddle, and I say solves. Well, it says solves on it, and and honestly. It's like uh, it's like when someone says, "Oh, do you believe in ghosts?" Well, I've seen ghosts, so that's solved. <laughs> it's like, and it's like you, yeah, I have died and I have come back, solved. Yeah, I understand well, how wait, it works. Wait, 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 wait. When you, when I, if, a lot of people say stuff, but when you work with the three top world authorities in the world in their fields, and then you go above them and literally tie up the strings to it and no one else has not to that degree and with those kind of world authorities then you can say it's solved yeah. and uh, not one has come against it not one even experience or a researcher not one world authority because they can't it's too right and it's not like i wrote it it's like i god wrote through me and it's too right uh, if, if, if did you get the book yes yeah, well, it's super detailed. They don't, they don't have near-death journals that are that detailed because I worked with the top, the dean of near-death re- international asked me to help him with his research. It's, there's no other book like it in the world. That's why it sells on Amazon for 800 a book. Uh, Clinton, uh, Prince Charles, Al Pacino, they, they all checked it out, the world authorities. This is not... It's, this is not no regular near-death book, and the information is not uh, regular near-death research. Um, it's super good. And you watch a book, too. It's going to include that and even more. It'll show you the reality of the near-death. So this is not like some psychic saying, I see the dead, or some, you know. This is not some, this is a real thing. The real researcher with the actual world authorities. Go to PMHA, I want to ask, J- ask Dr. Jacobs. I have pictures with them. I've been in their office. I used to work with the police. This is no clown like pretending to do something. This really happened. Now, if I look like, uh, say, a Brad Pitt, can you imagine? There would be ticker tape parades every month. So, but scientifically and realistically, it did happen. And I don't, um, definitely it's something I don't want is some kind of attention like the kind that the Stevie Nicks gets. I'd rather not have that. I don't want that. So it works out. It always works out perfect with God. I'd rather have the because you you have people who say that there's something, but they know when the show's over that they I really can't talk to the dead, mm-hmm. even though I just told an audience I did. I'd rather be able to say I can do this cause, and I did do it, than be able to pretend that I'm some mystic. I'd rather be able to have the scientists say you're a mystic than me to call myself a mystic and have only have words. I have the research behind it with the actual doctors. And there's those doctors don't work with regular, they don't work with other near-death researchers and only super experienced. So the fact that connected with them, and I knew that people would want a scientist connected with it, and I knew that they would want the mystical side. So I'm the mystical side. They're the science side, and you have to be sharp with them. You know? Yeah. Yeah, you so could, this is not this is not some you know clown on TV saying I'm this, I'm really the guy, and I've been like that for 22 years, and now we're going to do the same for UFOs. So it's this is no. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was um, I was talking to well, I was at this UFO conference uh, a couple of weeks ago, talking to a lot of people, a lot of documentary uh, documentarians, uh, documentarians. Um, 
Jeremy Corbyn, who wrote uh, and 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 filmed a documentary about Bob Lazar, the fellow that was doing reverse. Oh, yeah. um, his reverse, uh, oh, what do you call it? Oh my God! His reverse engineering on um, on yeah. on found UFOs, and 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 talked to Bob and uh, these these guys are like connected. And so like, when I say connected, it's it's like you actually touched a UFO. You you are looking at me like yeah, like yeah, that's what I do or did. But um, yeah, they're they are fantastic um, sources of information. It's just getting the information out, and I think their documentaries are, are you know, that way inclined to doing that. I should uh, fire your book off to uh, Jeremy and see if he's gonna, he wants to go off on a on that tangent. Uh, that would be kind of cool. I have your your story as a documentary and, and follow that um, follow that uh, that event or <laughs> event uh, all your events that you've. Uh, been been connected to over your lifetime and but i really want to thank you eugene for dropping by because this was uh was a good catch-up and uh we'll definitely chat again um and i will uh i will give you a shout in a few months and we'll, or a few months we'll catch up again and uh, see how everything's going on the ufo side yeah james thanks you know the uh or other that we did a few years ago, that out of body uh, one, that was really detailed. Uh, probably my first or second best ever. And this one was a really good one too. It'd be really interesting to hear the stuff because yeah. it always sounds different. But uh, you are able to pull out a lot of information um, without me, you know, having to speed through it. Or it's just it, it's enjoyable, like the way I can I can tell you a lot of stuff and uh, be allowed to explain it without it being forced or, yeah, it, or hurried. You channel. Um, I, I look at it as you almost channel things. Um, uh-huh. You know, we, we do the show, or try to do it uh, for about an hour and 20 minutes, and, uh, you know, we're up to almost two hours now. So it, it's interesting. Mm-hmm. It's uh, you When you get going, I just stand, step back and listen and then make some notes and then come back and say, okay, what, explain that again. Explain the veils again. Explain... Um, you know the mid range and the other dream. It's like uh, when you're, you're dreaming, and and uh, it, it's good. It, it is good. And don't worry about the times where you're going like, okay, what was the question? Because that's yeah, we're, okay. the, we're the guys that uh, we're sitting on the porch having a beer, and uh, somebody's listening to the conversation. And if, if you don't keep up, we're gonna pass you. Uh, and so that's yeah, the way it is. Yeah. So thanks again, Eugene. Eugene Braxton. Go to his American Mystic Facebook page uh, Eugene Braxton also look for his book American Mystic Solves Near Death Riddle uh, Amazon uh, yeah it's it's a great book and not enough pictures but that's just me yeah, yeah if I don't have pictures in a book I'm going to take a month to read it so Do they th- charge you for them yeah. you know they charge like for everything I'm like what the hell so I we put hey 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 let's be careful out there Far over the snow